Good morning everyone, a warm warm welcome to you and a happy new year. This is the first message we put out in the new year so I pray that you had a good time, that you were able to enjoy some, some time off maybe, but equally that you are just going to be blessed in this new year as we go on together in 2021. I just wanted to give you some information about the way our online services are going to be changing slightly um, in these next couple of months because we're still in lockdown, we're still going to be gathered virtually for a time. So I wanted to really encourage us to join join together on Zoom. We're still going to have this YouTube platform and the, the message is always going to be put out there, but it's not going to be a complete service on YouTube anymore because we really do want to encourage meeting together face-to-face on Zoom. It says in Hebrews 10, um, 24, 25, it says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds not giving up meeting together, as some of us are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. You know, Zoom is where we can have fellowship in this time. Zoom is where we can pray together. It's where we can have the Holy Spirit minister to us. And things can drastically change when we interact in that way. You know, it's great to have that time of fellowship and interaction and prayer and and we really want to encourage all of you to join us there. Obviously, it's going to be difficult for people sometimes to join all the time. But if you can make it, that would be great. If you don't have the details to, to join us on Zoom, then please get in touch with us either directly or use our email address, which is welcome at t-gwin.org. If you can get in touch with us there, then we'll just send you the links. We'll send you the codes so that you can join us every Sunday at 10.30 on Zoom. And if you are struggling to get on Zoom for whatever reason, um, then please do get in touch with us and we can help you there as well. We can help you to download the app and, and figure out how it all works. So please don't feel that you can't join us because everyone is welcome and we really want to encourage as many people as possible to join us on our Zoom service because that is where God is going to minister to us, like we believe. We're going to have live worship every week now, which will be from Lucas and the team here at Teagwin, so that's really exciting, looking forward to that. And also the speakers will be preaching live as well. So if you can do that, that will be brilliant. Today we've got a great treat in store. We've got Pastor Phelan Doherty um, speaking to us from Northern Ireland. And he's able to join us virtually on Zoom as well. And he's got a great word to share with us. He's really carrying a powerful word that the Lord has given him. And so this morning, I, I encourage you to stop what you're doing and to just sit and absorb what God is telling you through him today. It's really a great life-affirming message for you. So let's just pray before we listen to that, shall we? Heavenly Father, King of kings and Lord of lords, we thank you and we praise you that although we start this new year in a time of uncertainty, a time of maybe disappointment for some and, and struggle and challenge, we thank you that you are the God of all hope. We thank you and praise you that you are the King of Kings. That everything we have is in you and from you. And we have a home in eternity with you. And so Lord, we pray for Pastor Phelan as he, as he ministers his word, your word to us this morning. We pray that he will be filled with your spirit. And that we will know what you are saying to us. We will take it in and it will... It will just fill us up, it will refresh us, it will renew us and it will build us ready for what's to come in this new year. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to join you this morning. Um, it's wonderful to see so many smiling faces and everything Ben said is, is so correct. Just to be with God's people is something very, very special. I think we are most ourselves in the company of the body of Christ, because that's who we were made to be. Um, maybe we could say it this way, we were never made to be an I, we were made to be an us. And so there is a dynamic of the spirit which happens when we gather together, which is something absolutely beautiful. Paul said, um, well, he didn't say I have the mind of Christ or even you have the mind of Christ, but he said, we have the mind of Christ. And I just want to begin by reading a passage to you from uh, Matthew's gospel. It's actually Matthew chapter three, Perhaps you could turn to that. And we're going to read a few verses from verse 16 of Matthew 3. And these are six verses which actually straddle two chapters. Um, but in the original, of course, there was no chapter break. So it's interesting to read this right through. 
So I'm just reading from Matthew 3 and from verse 16, and you'll recognize this as the, as the baptism of Jesus. And it says, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but in every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's wonderful, actually, when you read the word of God, how you see something new every time. And uh, just then, as I was reading it, I saw something again that I hadn't noticed before. With that phrase, it actually says the Holy Spirit led Jesus up into the desert. <clears throat> and I really want to speak about being led up this morning. And we're going to come back to that scripture later on. But I want to begin by sharing with you uh, something that happened to me when I was a student uh, in London many, many years ago. And a friend of mine invited me to go sailing with him. And uh, I had never been sailing, and I'm really not a very good swimmer. So I was a little bit worried, but we got into this boat and off we went. And as it happened, it was a very, very windy day. And within a few minutes, um, we had sort of lost control of the boat and it capsized. Now, he had given me a life jacket, but when that boat turned over and I went into the water, I was absolutely terrified. And um, what happened next, he swam around. My friend called Tim and he grabbed a, a rope coming down from the mast and he said to me, Phelan, I'm going to pull this mast up. And as I do that, the wind's going to catch the sail and the boat's going to take off. So you'd better throw yourself into the boat when I tell you to. So we did this. And as he pulled the sail up, he shouted and I threw myself into the boat, still terrified. And off this boat went. But the wind still meant that the boat was still out of control. And within a moment or so, it had capsized a second time. So a second time, I found myself plunged into this water. And the same rigmarole again, pulling the boat up, calling me to throw myself in. In I went, off the boat went again. And finally, a third time with the boat still out of control, it capsized. And I went into the water the third time. Only the difference was the third time I went into the water, I was actually laughing. I was laughing my head off because now I was convinced. I was persuaded that the life jacket what I had put on, what I was connected to, what my life was in union with was strong enough to overcome the environment I was in. And once that truth was established in my heart, my vision lifted off myself and all my fears, and I began to appreciate where I was and the environment I was in. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote that there was such a time in his ministry in the province of Asia where things got so bad that he despaired of making it out alive. But in looking back at that time, the Lord showed him that through that season, a powerful truth had become established in his life. And he wrote of that experience in 2 Corinthians 1, 9. He said, but this happened, that we may not depend on ourselves, but on a God who raises the dead. And what I want to share with you this morning is that I believe the Lord knows that there are seasons and that there are environments in this life where we will find ourselves in, where from the natural appearance of the situation, we're completely out of our depth. Yet these are the very places and seasons in life where there comes a lifting up of vision and equipping to see beyond the natural appearance of things, to experience the overcoming life that we are in union with through Christ and to experience the reality of God with us to a degree that we've never done before. I know you know well that story in 2 Kings 6 where Elisha the prophet and the servant are surrounded by a vast army and the servant is terrified. And Elisha prays that famous prayer, Lord, open his eyes. And it says there, when the servant looked again, he saw that there were many, many more surrounding Elisha of the heavenly host than there was of the enemy. You see, two people can look at exactly the same situation, but see two entirely different things, depending on whether they're seeing from a natural perspective or seeing by the spirit. One can't see past the size of the challenge. The other can't see past the size of the provision. You know, and right now, in the midst of all that's happening in the world, and Lanethley and Derry and all over the world, you know, none of which is a surprise to the Lord. The great challenge, I believe, of the Spirit to the church now is saying, what do you see? 
can you see yet that there is more for you than there is against you? And that's why we've been given the Holy Spirit, the one who leads us up into the reality that heaven sees. Despite what you may have heard all of your life, the work of the Holy Spirit is not to help you make something of yourself by supplying you with a list of self-improvement tips. The Spirit is not here to say, try harder, but to say rather, see further. And his first way of opening our eyes is to address us as believers as more than conquerors, even when he finds us, like Gideon, totally disillusioned, because we have, in the words of Gideon, Gideon, never seen the mighty miracles our fathers told us about. I believe the Holy Spirit cannot but address those who are in Christ in a victorious manner, because he can only speak the truth. And the truth, the truth that he sees is that Christ and him crucified is sufficient for all our needs, for all seasons, and for all situations, including the one we're in right now. Now, I don't need to tell anyone here listening this morning, especially as we hear these prayer requests coming in, that that doesn't mean that this overcoming life he gifts us is a life apart from trouble. In fact, what I'm going to tell you this morning is that it's actually in the midst of trouble, in the midst of the worst times that we often first discover the power of this life to uphold us when all around us are sinking. We could say the light shines in the darkness and all the darkness can really do is better reveal the light in all its glory. And I believe it's the very seasons of life when nothing looks like it has been accomplished, that the Lord most insists on speaking to us as if all that needs to be done has been done. And he does that because he can only speak the truth. And the sufficiency of Christ's work is the truth, as seen from eternity, as seen from the heavenly realm. And that's where the Holy Spirit is lifting us, even as we're speaking this morning, into to see that, to see our lives from his perspective. That's where we're given the Spirit. In this life, you know, we often take our name, we take our identity, our vision, really, either from the spirit of the world or from the spirit that comes from God. There are only two places to take your vision of yourself from. Now, the spirit of the world will always name you after your works, for the world declares you must do in order to become. You must produce your own name. You know, for years, the spirit of the world has taught us that we must make something of ourselves. We must make a name for ourselves. The world says to us, try harder to do better in life, and you can earn that name you've always wanted to be known by successful. You know, and when that spirit of the world, which you could call self-effort, gets into the church, then the church too says to men and women, try harder to do better, and you too can earn that name you've always wanted to be known by, holy, blessed of God. Only a child who does not know their father has to name themselves. Only a child who does not know their father has to name themselves. But now listen to what Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2.12. Now we have not received the spirit of the word, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. I believe the first thing God wants us to know that has been freely given is our name. And this name, this holy calling, is described for us in 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10 as not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from before the foundation of the world, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. No wonder Jesus could say to his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans, because he knew that the Holy Spirit would impart to them and to us our identity, the spirit of sonship, by which we cry, Abba, Father. Now, just as I had to fall into that lake to discover the power of the life jacket to bear me up, so there are environments, there are seasons in life that by the grace of God enable us to discover which spirit we have allowed to name us, the spirit of the world or the spirit that comes from God. Now, the name the world gives you will seem utterly reasonable, rational, fair even, because it is a name you deserve according to your works but the name the Lord gives you seems utterly unreasonable, irrational, and downright foolish, for he doesn't name you or I according to our works, but as we've just heard, according to his purpose and grace given to us in Christ 
from before the foundation of the world. <laughs> the name Jesus addresses us by always seems scandalous. You just ask Zacchaeus's neighbors, that little man in Jericho who went up the tree to hear Jesus. Ask his neighbors as they listen to Jesus looking up into that tree and naming him whom they know as the greatest thief in that city as the one he has chosen to share his life with that day, his good name with. Or just listen to the protests of Gideon at being called mighty warrior whom the Lord is with. When Gideon knows in his life, from his perspective, he is exactly not the person the Lord has been with. Or has he put this, as he puts it, where has the Lord been? For if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles that our fathers told us about? Or perhaps we could go back to Acts chapter 9. I love that passage uh, where we see a, a disciple called Ananias in Damascus, who on hearing the Lord tell him to go and speak to Saul of Tarsus, of all people, the Christian killer, Ananias begins to tell God who Saul is in the words of many people, Ananias says. You see, because there are always two ways to see Saul, because there are two ways to see this world and everyone is. We can see people according to the spirit of God or according to the spirit of the world, according to how many people see them. So I'm speaking to you this morning about a season we're in where all the usual works you see that identify you and I as Christians, our plans, our programs, our buildings, have all been stripped away. And yet the Spirit is still saying to the church, look up, what do you see? Now, has it not always been God's way when he wants to train up his people to see as he sees, to bring them into the wilderness, the place where the Spirit of the world can only see loss and say to them, now what do you see? And right now across the world, many believers are having their vision lifted to see from heaven's perspective, to see by the Spirit. Because just as the prodigal son came to his senses in a famine, they too know that if they don't begin to see by the Spirit, they cannot go on from this place. That's why so often in Scripture, the wilderness is the place of breakthrough, of revelation. And what we find in God's Word is that men and women seem to break through best into an epiphany, a revelation of how God sees them, not when they're standing on the mountaintop being lauded by the world as a success, but when they're standing like Gideon in a hole in the ground, having known nothing but failure to produce. And that's why I love that account in Acts 9 of the Lord speaking to Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus to kill Christians. He speaks to him of his heavenly calling, his heavenly name, a light to the Gentiles. For he speaks to him, not when Saul is repenting in dust and ashes, but when he's in full fury and hatred, breathing out threats. You see, the world only deems us worthy to speak to according to our works, but we have a God who meets us at our worst. And at that point, calls us by his eternal name for us, the one I was dying to be with even from before the foundation of the world. That's his name for you and I. But how are men to be whom he calls them to be unless they believe? And how are they to believe his name for them unless they hear it spoken? And how are they to hear of the Spirit if there is not someone to speak of the Spirit? I mean, how many souls of Tarsus, I think in this generation, are walking the streets of Derry or the streets of Llanethley still breathing out hate because they're still waiting for the Ananiases in the church to breathe in the Spirit and begin to see them, not according to their deeds, but according to the Spirit. I love that passage in Acts 9 because Ananias gets a revelation of who Saul of Tarsus is in God's sight because the Spirit speaks to Ananias three, three things which really blow your mind when you think about the implications for you and I. I mean, first of all, he says to Ananias, I have a name, I have a calling for Saul of Tarsus that the world knows nothing about. Not even Saul knows it yet. The second thing he says is, I have a name for you too, Ananias, that you know nothing about. You are the man who goes to Saul of Tarsus and tells him his real name, my calling for him. And the third thing he effectively says to Ananias is, I'm so confident of who you are, Ananias, that I have already given Saul a dream in which he sees you going to him and laying hands on him to regain his sight. So you'd better go. Now, we have no time to dwell on that this morning, but that is a beautiful picture of the intertwining of lives by the Spirit. And that's what's happening even amongst us this morning. Now, we have a great responsibility, therefore, 
to see each other and so to speak to each other, not according to our history, not according to our works, but according to the Spirit. For such words call us upwards in Christ into our shared inheritance, the mind of Christ. You know, and that's a challenge when we're in a church situation sometimes, um, as in River City Church in Derry or as in Tiguin, maybe a situation where we've all known each other for years and therefore it presents a real challenge for us to see that way and speak that way because we're so aware of each other's earthly record of failure. Even Jesus found it, that it's tough for a bit to be a prophet in your own country. You'll find it much easier to flow in the prophetic among people you don't know in the flesh. Now, if only the Lord could get his prophets outside the church building and among strangers. Now, wouldn't that be a great season to see people learn to see and speak by the Spirit? Now, I think the most beautiful part of that whole account in Acts 9 are the two words that Ananias speaks to Saul the moment he meets him. These words cause something like scales to fall from Saul's eyes. To the man who supervised the death of Stephen, Ananias' first words are, Brother Saul. You know, if Ananias had only seen Saul by the spirit of the world, only knew him after his record, after the flesh, then the best he could have done would be to call him out. But we have been given the Holy Spirit that we could see further than seeing people after the flesh. We can do better than calling people out. We can call them up. And perhaps that's why Jesus said that the least believer under the new covenant is greater than the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. But we can only do that. We can only call people up when we see them by the Spirit. And how are we to see them by the Spirit if we haven't even yet seen ourselves by the Spirit? And how are our eyes to open if there is no one to speak to us as Ananias spoke to Saul? So let me ask you a question this morning. How do we know if we're beginning to see people as God sees them? And I believe that is when we begin to speak to them with the heart of a father, not a manager that we'll know we're beginning to see people as God sees them. You see, that vision of a father is so important if we're to call people upwards in Christ, up out of the soulish realm where they remain self-centered and grasping for everything because they can only see their lack because they've been continually pointed to their performance and up into their life in Christ where they can see by the spirits that even on the worst day of their life, they lack no good thing in Christ for they are the accepted and the beloved. This difference between speaking to people according to their works, that is their performance, and speaking to them according to their true worth is the difference between speaking as a manager and speaking as a father. See, if multitudes in the church, if we're not growing up into the mind of Christ as he wants us to, still not seeing ourselves after the Spirit, could it be that we too can still look at the church today and say what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.15? You have 10,000 instructors managers, but not many fathers. You see, a manager can give you great advice that can result in increased productivity in your life. But unfortunately, managerial language tends to speak to us of who we could be one day if we, rather than speak to us as who we are today because he. What's wrong with managerial language? Well, the danger of it is that it creates really a culture of good advice not good news. There is a world of difference between good advice and good news. And where good advice leaves us is that the local church eventually blends right in on Main Street alongside all the other charities who are also offering good advice, but perhaps even offering better coffee than we are. Hmm. You see, keep watering down the good news of what he has done with a little good advice on what we still need to do. And the result is that many of us as believers struggle to see ourselves as who we now are, now in Christ, who we are in the Father's eyes. Because our vision is being formed by the words of people who see us primarily as workers for his kingdom rather than sons in his kingdom. You know, I'm sure the elder brother would have had a lot of good advice for the prodigal son on what he should do to make his life more productive for the father. But the father saw a greater need in his son to know he was called to be a son not an employee working his way to a promotion. You see, a father never looks at his children primarily as workers. Nicola and I, we have four wonderful children. They've all grown up to work in four different fields. 
uh, but they weren't birthed out of our need to have people doing that work. We named them and we've always spoken to them as the apple of our eye, irrespective of their productivity. A father does not value or measure his children according to their performance. And that's why a father can impart what a manager can never impart. He can impart a revelation of identity that transcends earthly performance. He can impart the life of a son, not the life of an employee. You know, when believers come to see that they are a Christian, not because of their new behavior, but because of their new birth, that they're saved by grace through faith and this not of themselves, a remarkable thing happens. They finally stop trying to be a Christian and start living as a child of God because they begin to see themselves as their father sees them, hidden with Christ in God. And to see yourself the way the Father sees you is to be filled with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. And any believer full of thanksgiving, you know, is holier by accident than the most sin conscious, self-absorbed zealot. Irrespective of whether he finds them returning from the world, stinking of drink, or finds them working away in the church, stinking of self-righteousness, the Father always greets his children in the same way as the apple of his eye, a cause for rejoicing. That's what he said to the elder son, isn't it? Come on, son, rejoice with me. You know, irrespective of whether you are a Gideon this morning, hiding in a wine press, or Joshua looking at the size of Jericho's walls, you are greeted as victorious before there appears to be any natural evidence of that victory, any evidence that God is with you. And that's why inspired by the Holy Spirit, you know, when Paul greets his churches, irrespective of their moral failures or the heresy even at work in those churches, he greets them as the saints in Corinth, just as Ben said this morning, the saints, not the sinners in Corinth, because he understands that their fundamental lack is not willpower, it's vision. His message to them is not try harder, but see further. Can't you see, he wrote to the Corinthians, can't you see you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? Can't you see, he wrote, that all things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God? Can't you see that you were raised with Christ? And to the Colossians too, the Spirit declared in effect through Paul, can you see? Can you see what the Father sees? Can you see what is true of you? Listen to the first four verses of Colossians 3, uh, that this is still what the Holy Spirit says to the church today, even in the midst of a pandemic, when the world is screaming at you and I, about separation and death. This is what the Spirit is saying. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind in the things that are above, not in the things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be re revealed with him in glory. You know, that's Colossians 3 verses 1 to 4. You see, the spirit of the world can only speak to us of what our lives could be one day. Only the spirit that comes from God can say to us, your life is. Because the spirit that comes from God comes from a father, and a father imparts the life of a son, not the life of an employee working his way toward a promotion. Now, yes, of course, Paul had some instructions for his churches on their behavior. Of course he did. But he knew that unless their eyes opened to who they already were in Christ and what they already had, all things, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, they would continue to grasp for the things of this world. Because as long as people can't see their true value, they will strive to make themselves more valuable by grasping for stuff. So yes, the Lord did have some instructions for Gideon, but the first thing that had to happen was for Gideon to see who he was in God's eyes, mighty warrior whom the Lord is with. And yes, the Lord did have some instructions for Joshua on how he was to take Jericho. But before that, it is recorded in Joshua 6 that the first thing the Lord required of Joshua was to see. And you know, many times in my life, the Lord has brought me back to those verses in Joshua 6, 1 and 2, where he said this, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with this king and all its fighting men. You know, I just love that. Let's apply that to our own situation. 
even to your situation this morning. Because of the pandemic, the whole nation was shut up and nobody was went out and nobody came, came in. But the Lord said to Tiguin Community Church, see, I have given Renethli into your hands. So what I'm saying this morning is that if this year has been a season where we have been stripped of much of what we've been busy with, and perhaps much that we have been unknowingly drawing our identity, our name from, then this is one of the best seasons in life, the best places to hear God speak to us our true name. The wilderness, the place of no natural resources where the Spirit takes us to root and ground us in the sufficiency, in fact, the abundance of the resources we have in the Spirit. In other words, it's where the Lord raises up his prophets, raises up our capacity to see provision where natural eyes can only see lack. And the greatest provision he wants us to see is his presence with us, his shared life. I really believe that revival, you know, is us awakening to the reality that we have not been deprived of. We have been dulled to the presence of God. You know, this has been a dark period in many people's lives, but it is in the dark that he trains us to see in the dark. You know, if you're in the natural, if you walk out tonight in the middle of the night, if you walk out of a well-lit house into the pitch black, for a time you'll see virtually nothing. But after a while, your eyes begin to adapt and you begin to see further than you could see before. You see your eyes become trained to see in the dark. At the beginning of lockdown, I remember sitting in my garden, you know, and, and uh, I felt the Lord check me about wishing these days away or thinking of them as lesser days because I wasn't getting anything done. When in reality, these were days to lift my eyes higher than what I was doing and instead to look to see my life from his perspective. And at that time, you know, I did wonder how long will it take me to see that way? And one day as I was thinking about that, this phrase dropped into my spirit. You can't train people to see in the dark who haven't been in the dark long enough to see through it. You can't train people to see in the dark who haven't been in the dark long enough to see through it. The ministry of the Spirit is to open our eyes to what Paul called in 1 Corinthians 2.12, the things freely given to us by God, the things that are ours in Christ. You know, we could also call them the things that remain ours because of what he has done, not because of what we could do. But often the greatest opportunity to get to see these things that remain is during a shaking season, when what can be shaken falls down to reveal more clearly to us what cannot be shaken. Or in the words of Jesus, it is only when the storm comes that a man gets to see if he has been building his life on a foundation that remains or on one that is washed away like sand. Have we built our lives on who he says we are because of what he has done? Or have we been building our lives in who men say we are because of what we have done? The Lord doesn't allow these seasons to put an end to our ministries. These experiences are, in fact, the nursery where the most supernatural aspect of our ministries are established and nurtured in our souls, our eternal calling and identity, our name. And this is the preparation for the real battle ahead because the Lord knows that the fundamental issues of our identity of ministry and discipleship and all we're trying to do, they hinge not in the question of what should we be doing, but rather who are we? Are we those whom God is with or not? You know, just before David went out to meet Goliath, Saul challenged the young shepherd boy, didn't he, as to where his confidence and authority came from. And immediately David pointed to his experience in the wilderness with the lion and the bear because it was there when he was all alone and out of his depth that he too learned that this happened, that he would not depend on himself, but on a God who raises the dead. You see, to me, the real question for the church now is not what will we be doing, but who will be doing it? Will we be living more like Saul or David? You see, Saul was seeing only by natural vision, and so he couldn't see past the size of Goliath because natural vision can't see past the size of the lack. But David was seeing by the Spirit, and such vision sees through, sees beyond the size of the lack, to see the size of the provision. One vision sees Goliath as too big to defeat. The other sees him as too big to miss. In the wilderness of this past year, no one here listening to me this morning has heard the enemy say, what do you think you're doing? 
But we've all heard a different question. Who do you think you are now? Look at the lack in your life now. Are you really the chosen, the called of God? Where is the proof of that in what you have produced? And that brings us back to where we began in that scripture in Matthew. Jesus, 40 days in the wilderness. And this is the accusation that comes to him. The one that questions his identity. The devil says, if you are the son of God, then why has all this happened to you? Where is the provision of your father now? If you are the son of God, you should have the power to be your own provider. You should be able to produce this abundant life in the visible realm. In other words, the enemy wants us to draw our beliefs, our life from the natural realm, from the natural appearance of things. But to build your beliefs, your life on the appearance of the natural realm, on what men say about you in this world. Well, you know, that feels fine when things are going well and you appear to be successful and blessed. But when the storm comes and when the wilderness comes and you find that the life you were feeding off has dried up and there is little or no thanksgiving left in your heart, that is the time of awakening to the truth that the only life that does not let you down, the only stream that does not dry up in any season of life is not the view and opinion of men on you, but the view and opinion of God. Jesus was strong in spirit because for 40 days he'd been drinking deeply of the words of his father at his baptism. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Notice the father didn't say, this could be my beloved son, depending on how he does in the desert. You see, those words of, of the father came before Jesus had done one miracle. In other words, his ministry wasn't in order to attain or achieve the love of his father. Rather, it was flowing from the love of his father in him. Ministry wasn't where Jesus got his identity from. To Gwyn Community Church, ministry is not where you get your identity from either. Jesus got that straight from the Father by the power of the Spirit. And when we too have got to that place in the wilderness where we're no longer living just by what this world feeds us, but are drinking in the words of the Father, his name for us, then we too are ready to go out into this world in the power of the Spirit. In other words, as full of thanksgiving in the worst of days as we are in the best. And by such a life, the will of the Father is seen and done on the earth as it is in heaven. Because 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us that's exactly the will of God. You remember, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And that's why I love that account in Acts 16 of Paul and Silas in that jail in Philippi in total lockdown, chained to a wall, yet bursting with thanksgiving to the utter astonishment of the other prisoners. Because once again, we see in that picture, men at the lowest point of their lives experience the highest experience men can know, the voice of the Father calling them by name. Behold, my beloved sons with whom I'm well pleased. And that's what he says over you to Gwyn Community Church this morning. You see, the Christian life is Christ's life, the life of a much loved son. And our witness is to live that life now because only the life of a much loved son can reveal the reality of a loving father. I'll say that again. Only the life of a much loved son can reveal the reality of a loving father. No wonder when his disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to relate properly to God, how to pray, he said, you must begin here. Our Father, who art in heaven. What a place to begin. I want to start you there in 2021. Can you see that Jesus was asking them to begin from the highest of heights? Our Father, who art in heaven, is not a statement of a goal to be reached. It's an identity to be birthed from. The highest life any man or woman can live is the life of someone who believes God to be their father. And such a person doesn't need the trappings of earthly power to know their worth. You know, by natural sight, Jesus must have looked a sight standing beaten and bloodied before Pilate as Pilate questioned him. He didn't look much like a king, but yet private Pilate really, Pilate became deeply disturbed in that moment because he could sense something from Jesus. He could sense the authority of a king because authority is knowing who you are. Ministry wasn't where Jesus got his identity from. 
The Lord has not allowed this season or any wilderness season to put an end to our ministries or our churches. These experiences are in fact the nursery where the most supernatural aspect of our ministries are being established and nurtured in our souls. Our eternal calling, our identity, our name, because to come out of the desert knowing your name is to come out in the power of the Spirit. And that's how I trust you're coming out of 2020, knowing your name, knowing the power of the Spirit. Let's just bow our heads for a moment. I just want to pray. Father, I just thank you right now for the power of your word to lift, to lift, to lift vision. The power of your word to call forth the life that you see in each person I'm speaking to right now, Father. For you see them from the eternal realm. You see them from a finished work. You see each person here, not according to their record, not according to how the world sees them. You see them differently. And Father, even as Mary spoke to Elizabeth and the baby in Elizabeth's womb jumped, John the Baptist, at the sound of a voice of someone with the presence of God. I just declare, Lord, that as we speak to each other this morning, there would be a jumping in our spirits as the new man in Christ jumps up the calling in our lives to be in Christ, not to try to get somewhere, but to be in him. Father, we thank you for that. We will not fear the wilderness because it is this place that is establishing in our hearts the truth that, Lord, you are the stream that never dries up in our life. You have become in us a fountain springing up to eternal life. And I just declare, Father, right now, under the sound of this message, people are beginning to drink from that stream. For you promised that to that woman at the well. If you taste of this water, it will become in you a spring springing up to eternal life. So I thank you, Father. And I declare your pleasure and your delight over your children this morning. And I declare for an opening of ears, an opening of eyes, that in this, perhaps one of the darkest or worst moments of their life, in this place where they have been chained to a wall as such, in this place, there will be a release of praise and worship that can only come from people who see that they died and their life is hidden with Christ and God.